so the food that is taken in the form of nutrition helps the human beings or organisms to obtain energy in the form of ATP and this energy is required for the organism for the metabolic process for it to perform activities that consider or that is essential for us to be in a state of living now the food that we consume consists of a number of biomolecules now what are biomolecules these are molecules that are typically the carbon based molecules that are typically found in the living organisms whether you talk of the simplest organism or you talk about the most advanced complex organism the biomolecules are found and what are these biomolecules that are part of this food major components now these are the proteins carbohydrates and fats now during the process or throughout the process of these uh, uh, digestion these biomolecules actually get degraded degraded into what see these biomolecules are complex structures these complex structures are made up of certain uh, simple components just like when you're building a house you have to layer the bricks connect each of these bricks by the cement similarly here also you have certain molecules like the brick and to that we are combining those molecules and we are forming this complex biomolecular structures now the protein when we talk about they are made up of the amino acids the carbohydrates are made up of simple sugars that is glucose and the fats are made up of fatty acids and glycerol so in other words these that is amino acids glucose and fatty acids and glycerols forms the monomeric units for the protein carbohydrates and fats respectively now after digestion what is the fate of this now something like the glucose is going to be used for production of energy the ATP that we are talking about till now so this ATP is produced with the help of the cellular respiration now during cellular respiration see this is very much different from the regular physiological respiration that we talk about inhalation and exhalation this is different this is cellular respiration that involves a set of uh, metabolic pathways that involves glycolysis, Krebs cycle and electron transport chain and finally oxidative phosphorylation. So by these steps, by these processes, finally we derive adenosine triphosphate out of the glucose. Now you can see here I am having this adenine molecule which is a nucleotide and to that I am having 1 and 2 and 3 different phosphates now these are the three different phosphates that forms the triphosphate so that's why the name adenosine adenosine is this molecule is adenosine adenosine triphosphates now when we want energy when the cells require the energy they break down see as you can see here this is the high energy bond that connects the, the two phosphates now when the energy is required ATP is broken down into something called ADP or adenosine diphosphate so here you can see the inorganic phosphate and you can see here this is the ADP and you also get some amount of energy what is that energy how much energy we get that is 30.5 kilojoules per mole of energy that we get from a single ATP molecule breaking down into ADP and inorganic phosphate now this is a breakdown reaction we are breaking down the ATP into ADP and this is referred to as a catabolic reactions now the other part that is when required as we said we also need to produce energy in the form of ATP and the ATP is going to be produced with the help of the ADP adenosine diphosphate. So this ADP is going to combine with a inorganic phosphate that is to form the ATP and in this process we are building up something we are building ATP from ADP and, and PI. Now this is an anabolic reaction okay and this typical process requires energy so when we talk about a metabolic reaction it can be catabolic reaction or it can be anabolic reactions in a catabolic reaction we break down a complex molecule into simpler forms whereas in case of anabolic reaction we take the simpler forms and we make a complex structure or complex compound out of that to give you an example you have learned about photosynthesis in that what happens we create the plant creates glucose which is complex than the carbon so carbon is used to make glucose that's why it's an anabolic process 
Now, in this process of digestion or respiration, what we are doing? We are taking the glucose, for example, in case of respiration, we take the glucose and we break it down into the simplest form. As it is carbon based, we break it down into the simplest form of carbon that is CO2. So, that is the anabolic and catabolic reactions that together form the metabolic reactions of the human body or any other organisms. Now, how is the food processed? Let's understand that when we take in the food, the food contains protein, complex carbohydrates and triglycerides. Now, when we talk about proteins, protein after digestion gives us to the amino acids, from carbohydrates we get glucose and from triglycerides we get fatty acids and glycerols. Now, whenever you have excess amount of these carbohydrates, they are typically stored in the form of glycogen in the liver. Now, these glucose, amino acids and glycerol and fatty acids, they help in the process or responsible for the process of energy production in the form of ATP from ADP or adenosine diphosphate. Now, the process that is uh, happening here, that is from the food to all the way to the energy production, right? Here, this process, this pathway, we are going to learn in the process of digestion and this process energy production we will talk in the process of the respiration or cellular respiration here also you can see the process of catabolism and anabolism as you can see here all the blue lines as you can see these are all breakdown reactions. these are all breakdown reactions, and these are all called catabolic reactions but again you can see these structures that is here one that is ADP to ATP glycerol fatty acids forming lipid synthesis and the amino acids forming the proteins now these are the build up reaction and this why these are called the anabolic reactions now here let us begin by understanding the organs that are involved in the process of the digestion to start with we have the mouth and we have the tongue then in this area we are going to have the salivary gland. Now the salivary gland is not one, instead it is three parotid, sublingual and submandibular glands and these help in the secretion of the saliva that contains a very important enzyme that begins the process of chemical digestion. What is that? We will see in a minute. Now the next organ or the next structure that is associated is the pharynx. Pharynx is a small muscular structure that connects the oral cavity with that of the food pipe also known as the esophagus. Esophagus is a long tubular structure that connects the pharynx to that of the stomach. Now the food gets processed in the stomach, the protein digestion begins in the stomach and from here the food which is partially acidic begins to move to the small intestine. And the small intestine is divided into the duodenum first part, jejunum second part and ileum that is the third part. Now here you have to understand that there are three more structures or organs that is liver, gallbladder that work in a closed manner and then you have the pancreas and these organs pour their secretions, the enzymes or other components into the duodenum and that help in digestion of the food particles. Now from there the food moves basically the next organ that is associated is the large intestine and when we talk about large intestine you have structures like the cecum that is here in this particular area there is a cecum and then you have the ascending colon that is this particular area there is the ascending colon and from here you are having connection with the dis, uh, transverse colon and then from here you are going to have the descending colon and descending colon connects to the rectum where the undigested food particles or the fecal matter gets stored temporarily and finally you have the anus through which the undigested food particle or the fecal matter gets removed. So these are the different structures that are associated with the digestion in the human beings. Let us see one by one what actually happens in this processes. So now here you see the mouth. Let us begin with that. Now the mouth actually begins by mechanical digestion. In this, all the food that we take in, we start chewing the food and this process is called mastication of the food. Now, during this process of mastication, the salivary glands that are present, as you can see here, 
parotid sublingual and some mandibular they start releasing the saliva that contains the salivary amylase now amylase is an enzyme that typically act the substrate is going to be the starch or the carbohydrates now the salivary amylase here they act on the carbohydrates or the starch and start it to digest it it basically breaks it down and partially digest it now uh, the carbohydrates are known as polysaccharides and uh, they give rise to the end they give rise to the monosaccharides so here what they do they break down large polysaccharides into a uh, smaller fragments or something called the disaccharides two sugar units that is a disaccharide a single sugar unit called monosaccharide and more than that is called the polysaccharides now once you have this food particle after chewing and after this chemicalization begins the carbohydrates basically getting partially digested that food particle that is slightly alkaline in nature that is called the bolus and this bolus is going to be passed on to the esophagus now when the food moves to the esophagus there is have to be a movement from the esophagus to the stomach and this movement is called peristalsis okay it is going to be held by the process of peristalsis so what is happening here is you can see in the picture so uh, you have the mouth from here the food is going to be moving so the peristalsis means rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the food pipe so the muscles here at this beginning let us understand they will start contracting from both the sides okay they will start contracting here so when the contraction occurs the food get pushed towards the downside okay the food gets pushed towards the downside now the moment the food gets pushed towards here right to the downside then this particular area where the contraction was there as you can see here they actually relax there is no more contraction the food the food pipe or the esophagus the muscles here they relax but now as the food is here the contraction begins in a new particular location that basically is going to push the food towards the downside okay it is going to push the food towards the downside as you can see here similarly the food moves when it is moving to a new location the previous location where there was contraction now this particular location the previous contraction uh, muscles the area that is contracted they actually relax and now there is a contraction at a new location so by this process of rhythmic contraction and relaxation the food particle that is the bolus moves from one uh, from the uh, new uh, fr uh, from the beginning uh, of the food pipe towards the end of the food pipe or the esophagus and during this process right uh, at the end of this process the bolus have to move from the esophagus to the stomach and there is a very important structure there is a valve and that is called a gastroesophageal sphincter this muscle sphincter muscle is going to regulate the movement of bolus into the stomach right when it is not going to open always so whenever there is a requirement the gastroesophageal sphincter opens and allows the bolus to move to the stomach now before we go any uh, further let us understand little bit about the tongue now we uh, understand that tongue is responsible for us to sense the taste of the food and uh, you can see here this is a structure of the tongue dorsal dorsal surface of the tongue and you can see here there are a number of this structure called papillae okay there is a number of this called papillae the different type of papillae are there now the papillae on the they contain the taste receptors so the receptors the structure that is responsible for us to uh, you know uh, get a feel about the taste of the food whether it is salt whether it is sweet or sour now there is another structure that is epiglottis which is very important this particular structure this here now the epiglottis is basically cartilaginous in nature and this will prevent the entry of the food into the trachea or the windpipe when we are swallowing the food basically it is going to close the windpipe when we swallow the food now the next organ is going to be the stomach so here you can see that the stomach is typically divided into three parts cardia fundus and you are going to have the pyloric region okay there are three structures cardia fundus and pyloric again you don't need to learn everything in detail but again just uh, for information now uh, these are the different layers right you can see as here okay there are the different layers of the 
stomach but the reason why I'm putting up this particular image is to show you the actual image how it looks inside the human body so you can see here this particular area shows the stomach in the human body now this is going to be the cardiac area this is a fundic area and you are going to be having the pyloric area in this particular part so this this particular structure this particular area is the stomach in here this is going to be the liver okay and here you are going to have the spleen here now as you can see here i was talking about the uh, sphincter in the previous case there is another sphincter in this case here that is to allow the foot from the stomach to the duodenum or the small intestine there is again a regulatory mechanism that is the pyloric sphincter regulates the movement of the foot from the pile uh, from the stomach to the small intestine now there are gastric glands present in the walls of the stomach and these gastric glands release typically three components one is the hcl second is a protein that is called pepsin and the third is mucus now remember that the pepsin is actually not released in an active form it is rather released in an inactive form and that is called pepsinogen now the pepsinogen gets activated only if the condition is acidic so the hcl here it basically activates the enzyme pepsinogen into its active form pepsin now the second thing the pepsin can act on the foot only if it is alka acidic so the foot that is coming from the esophagus the bolus actually is an alkaline condition so the hcl makes the foot acidic and also activates the enzyme pepsin now the pepsin acts on proteins and digests it partially digestion occurs here now the pepsin acts on the protein to form peptones and proteoses so what are these so proteins are basically made up of amino acids and these amino acids in a long chain of amino acids is called polypeptide now when you are having two that is called dipeptide and when you when you are called, when you are having only one it is called simply a amino acids so this long chain of amino acids or the polypeptide that is going to be broken into smaller fragments that is going to begin with the help of the enzyme pepsin in the stomach so protein digestion begins in the stomach now the mucus that is secreted it is going to protect the inner lining the cells or the tissues on the inner linings of the stomach because you are having the hcl secreted it might damage and that's why to protect the cells in the lining of the stomach inner lining of the stomach we are going to have the secretion of the mucus now as we are saying now the movement of food that is now it is called chyme what is chyme chyme is basically the partially digested acidic food remember partially digested acidic food that is present in the stomach and moves to the small intestine it is called chyme now the movement of the chyme from the small intestine to the sorry to the small intestine uh, from the stomach is regulated by the pyloric sphincter muscle the small intestine is the longest part of the elementary canal with a large amount of coiling and as you know that the small intestine is already divided into three parts duodenum jejunum and ileum duodenum is one of the shortest part uh, it connects the stomach to the jejunum and ileum connects the small intestine to the cecum of the large intestine now typically you have to understand one thing here that the herbivores right herbivores typically consume grasses or the plants and these contain a large amount of cellulose now the cellular digestion takes a larger time and that's why the length of the small intestine typically is larger in case of the herbivores compared to the carnivores carnivores eat uh, for example in carnivores the meat digestion takes a lesser time now the small intestine also act as the site of complete digestion of the carbohydrates proteins and fats very important direct question can be asked now the when the food have to, when the digested food have to be moved from the small intestine to the large intestine again there is a check there is a valve so between the end of the ileum and the beginning of the large intestine that is going to be the cecum there is a valve called the ileocecal valve and this regulates the movement of the digested food 
from the small intestine to the large intestine okay now let us understand what happens in the small intestine now the duodenum receives the secretions from both the liver and pancreas so let us see how it is going to happen now as you can see here the let me zoom in a little bit uh, yes i guess okay so as you can see here this is the liver and here you are going to have the gallbladder and you are going to have the pancreas here now the liver secretes bile now the bile when food is present needed to be digested the bile gets secreted directly but when the food is not there in the uh, not uh, there uh, we need not have the bile secreted for digestion the bile that is secreted at that point of time gets stored in the gallbladder remember that bile gets continuously secreted by the liver and when there is food to digest it gets secreted directly into the duodenum and if it is uh, the if the food is absent then the bile gets stored in the gallbladder it gets concentrated and stored in the gallbladder now the pancreas is a heterocrine gland now heterocrine means it acts as both endocrine as well as exocrine now the endocrine portion secretes the insulin and glucagon but we are more interested in the exocrine part that is going to release the pancreatic juice that contains a large number of enzymes and certain other salts now let us move on here you can see an a real anatomy there's a real picture dissected from a human body and you can see the liver here this particular area is going to be the uh, ligament this particular area is going to be the gallbladder here we are having the spleen and here you can see the small this is the small intestine and here you can see the cecum connected with the large intestine okay now here also you see a clear image picture of the uh, liver again it is taken from an adult human body and uh, as you can see here the liver is actually divided into lobes you are having the left lobe and the right lobe and you can see the gallbladder in this particular area and you can see the location of gallbladder okay sorry location of the liver in the body now here is an image where you can see again the pancreas this particular structure is the pancreas and here you are going to have the spleen this is the spleen area and this is the duodenum this particular area is the duodenum and you can see there are number of the ducts probably that are connected from the pancreas to the duodenum now the food coming from the stomach is acidic and has to be made alkaline for the pancreatic enzymes to act the point here is hcl had basically made the food acidic the food in the mouth and the esophagus were alkaline in nature now the pepsin produced in the stomach requires an acidic condition so the hcl made the food acidic but now the enzymes present in the pancreatic juice requires an alkaline condition to act so now the food first has to be made alkaline that is the chyme has to be made alkaline and this process this uh, conversion of the acidic food to alkaline is accomplished with the help of the bile juice now the bile juice from the liver accomplishes the conversion and in addition acts on the fats now what are these fats why are these important the fats here are actually in large globules and the enzymes cannot act them in efficient manner so the fats large globular fats have to be broken down into smaller globules of the fats and this process of breaking down of the larger fat globules into smaller fat globules with the help of the bile salts with the help of bile salts for that the enzymes can act efficiently on them what is the enzyme lipase can act efficiently efficiently on them is called the emulsification so emulsification of fat is breakdown of the larger fat globules into smaller ones with the help of the bile salts now the trypsin present in the pancreatic juice digests the proteins 
and the lipase breaks down the emulsified fat. Now the trypsin, remember, it uh, like the pepsin also acts on the protein, but the trypsin is secreted in the small intestine by the pancreas and it requires an alkaline condition compared to that of the pepsin which require an acidic condition. Now the walls of the intestine secrete intestinal juice. So the small intestine receives the secretions from the liver gallbladder, pancreas and also its own wall in the form of intestinal juice also known as the succus entericus. And these, remember, contains number of enzymes and this is what is going to finally break down the partially digested food, right, uh, that has been digested in the other organs till now, that is partially digested. These enzymes present in the succus entericus break it down completely into its monomeric forms, right. So finally, these enzymes convert the proteins, remember, very important, into amino acids carbohydrates into glucose fats into fatty acids and glycerol remember so protein is forming amino acids carbohydrates is forming glucose fats is forming fatty acids and glycerol okay so, so these are the things that you have to keep in mind now what happens after the process of digestion of the food once the food particles are completely digested, we have glucose, amino acid, fatty acids and glycerol. Now the glucose and amino acids have to be transported out of here so that it can be used elsewhere, especially the glucose because glucose is required by each and every cell so that they can be utilized to form energy with the help of the cellular respiration pathways. Now to help in the process of the absorption of the digested food particles you can see here the small intestine is going to have a large number of infoldings right you can see this this large number of infoldings question is why are these present as i said they are going to help the process of absorption how remember that the presence of these infoldings they increase the surface area for absorption of the digested food particles Right. So, how are these actually present? Let us see. So, you can see here, this is the small intestine. This area is the small intestine. And when you cut open, you can see this infoldings. Okay. And these infoldings are called villi. Okay. These are called villi. Intestinal villi. Now, along with that, you also can see that there are these blood vessels that are typically supplied in a abundance to this villi area. You can see in this particular image in the second image. Now let us understand why and how these are present. Now these blood capillaries are typically going to each and every villi along with something called the lactyl. Now the lactyl is basically a lymphatic vessel as you can see here these are the lymphatic vessels. So the lymph is flowing in this and the blood vessels. Blood is flowing in the blood vessels. Now when you are having a glucose the glucose, as I said, need to be transported to each and every cell in the body. So once you have the glucose molecule, it is going to be absorbed by the villi and it is going to be transported to the blood capillary. And through this blood capillary, it is going to be transported throughout the body. So every cell receives the glucose once it is absorbed from here. Now the lactyl is going to be responsible for absorbing or basically transporting the fats digested fat molecules. Now you also can see that the microvilli, there is a structure called microvilli. If you take a single cell here and you zoom in, you can see again the infoldings. Uh, that is, these are the brush border and these are the brush border epithelial cells. Now these have this border, uh, brush like appearance, they are called the brush border and this also further helping increase the surface area of absorption. So there is a typical question that is asked in the examination, why does the villi and my villi are you know richly supplied with blood vessels the answer is the absorbed food materials that is the glucose once absorbed have to be transported to each and every cell and the blood vessels present in the villi transports this glucose to each and every part of the body so that every cell 
can produce the ATB that is required for it to function. Now on this particular area you can see uh, the electron microscopes, electron micrographs. The first one is the electron micrograph the circular folds. These are basically the circular folds as you can see in here, right. The second one is of the, um, you know, uh, what do you call that, uh, this is the villi, okay, these are the villi, you can see in here. And the third one is the electron micrograph of the microvilli. So this is the structural organization of the intestine, uh, in, in uh, the inner portion of the intestine with the villi and the microvilli. Now comes to the last structure that is the large intestine. As we know, the large intestine has the cecum, ascending colon, then you have the transverse colon, and finally you have the descending colon that opens into the rectum and finally it is defecated that is removed with the process of uh, from, through the anus. Now all the unabsorbed food materials from the small intestine actually move to the large intestine and this movement is actually regulated right every time the foot cannot simply move from the small intestine to the large intestine. The first portion of the large intestine is the cecum. So there is again a uh, you know uh, check between the movement of the foot, undigested foot from the small intestine to the large intestine and that is called the ileocecal valve that we talked about earlier. So what about the function? There are two major functions. One is to reabsorb whatever water molecules that are required, that are present along with certain minerals and drugs. The second is it is going to release the mucus and the mucus is going to bind the undigested food particles together so that it is going to be easy for the movement that is it is going to help in lubrication of the undigested food particles through the movement during the movement in the colon all the way to the rectum. So to summarize the mouth ingests the food, chews it, mixes the food and begins the chemical breakdown of the carbohydrates with the help of the salivary amylase and it pushes the food towards the pharynx. The pharynx propels the food from the oral cavity to the esophagus of the foot pipe and the foot pipe or the esophagus propels the food to the stomach with the help of the peristaltic movement. In the stomach, the food is going to be mixed with the gastric juice to form the, stru form the structure chyme and it begins the chemical breakdown of the proteins, right? It's the first place where the proteinization begins. And the food is then released, the chyme, acidic chyme is released into the duodenum. The small intestine mixes the chyme with the digestive juice. It propels the food at a slow rate so that the digestion and absorption can continue. And it also absorbs the breakdown product of the carbohydrates, protein, lipids, nucleic acids along with the vitamin, minerals and the water molecules. And it is also performed physical digestion like what you said mechanical digestion in the mouth what happens? Chewing, mechanical digestion. So here also we are going to have the physical digestion via segmentation. So the foot particles here get fixed, uh, mixed physically. Now the accessory organs that is the liver, gallbladder and pancreas. The liver produces the bile salts which emulsify the lipids and help in the digestion absorption of the food particles. The gallbladder stores, concentrate and release the bile as and when required. The pancreas produces the digestive enzymes and the bicarbonate ions. The large intestine, it further breaks down the food materials. It absorbs most of the residual water, electrolytes that is ions vitamins and it also propels the food towards the rectum and finally it is going to help in the process of elimination of the fecal matter or the undigested food material after complete digestion and absorption. So this basically summarizes the entire process of digestion in the human beings. Now here you can see the different mechanisms that are employed by the body to achieve the digestion process that is you can see here propulsion right swallowing peristalsis then you have the chemical digestion with the help of enzymes mechanical digestion <coughs> chewing churning in the stomach segmentation in the small intestine and also the absorption that is absorption of the nutrient water 
to the blood vessels and the lymph vessels and water absorption to the blood vessels in the large intestine so this are the mechanism that are employed by the body to achieve the digestion and absorption in the human beings now here is a summary a little bit extra a summary of the entire process let's begin so when we talk about organs that is one mouth now it contains the salivary glands that release the tylen or the salivary amylase acts on the carbohydrates and break it into disaccharides or the maltose and the condition here acidic sorry the condition here is alkaline the stomach is going to contain the gastric glands contain the pepsin release release the pepsin hcl and mucus now the pepsin acts on the protein that is the substrate and it forms peptones what are the peptones partially hydrolyzed proteins now the hcl is going to help in conversion of the alkaline food into acidic and it also help in activation of the pepsin from the inactive form pepsinogen and you all know the mucus is going to help in protecting the inner lining of the stomach from the acidic hcl now the liver and gallbladder they help in secretion of the bile which contain the bile pigments bile salts cholesterol phospholipids and they help in conversion the chyme from acidic to the alkaline condition and they also help in the emulsification of the fats now the pancreas the exocrine part of it produces the pancreatic juice containing trypsin chymotrypsin carboxypeptidase that all act on the proteins different form of digested proteins and they convert it into dipeptides now <coughs> the pancreatic amylase acts on the starch and convert it into disaccharides the pancreatic lipase converts the fats into emulsified fats into fatty acids and glycerol now coming to the last small intestine it is going to release this intestinal juice or succus entericus that contains number of enzymes again there is a limited list there are few more enzymes you learn in the high class now it contains dipeptidases so they act on dipeptides dipeptides if you remember these are the partially digested proteins and finally produce the amino acids out of it so the dipeptidases converts the dipeptides into amino acids maltase is an enzyme that acts on maltose maltose is a disaccharide consisting of two molecules of glucose glucose is a monomer so when the maltose is acted upon by the enzyme maltase we get two molecules of glucose similarly the lactase acts on lactose and we get glucose and galactose the sucrase acts on the sucrose mole sucrose molecule give rise to glucose and fructose similarly at the end you have the lipase lipase acts on the fats and it converts fats into fatty acids and glycerol so these are the different enzymes substrate their functions where are they released from and what is the organ structure they are present in now the ph condition as you can see here in every part it is alkaline except in one place and that is the stomach it is a place where the food is in acidic condition and in the remaining places the digestion occurs in a alkaline condition so this basically completes the process of digestion in the human beings i hope you all are clear if you have doubts please ask your question you can put a comments i'll try to reply thank you all for coming here